Come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Oh, hey there, gamers. So as you see, I am enjoying Enduro, which I managed to transfer to my DIY cottage in the last video. I played this game a ton, so now I feel I would like to play the greatest game of all time, the E.T. Unfortunately, there is one problem. As I mentioned in my last video, my cottage only can support a single 4 kilobyte game. But the ET is whopping 8 kilobytes. So that means I would need to take out my soldering iron and start doing some modifications to the cottage. Before I started doing that, I'm very curious to see what would happen if I just put the ET game ROM on the current cottage as it is right now without any modifications, what will happen? Let's find out. Okay, let's read the EEPROM. Okay, it seems to be empty. So let's load the ET ROM. As you see, it's 8 kilobytes. Okay, let's open it. And we'll leave options as default. Okay, we loaded something. Alright, let's program. Mm, it's taking more time. And we're done. So let's add the cartridge. Come on, get in. Let's turn it on. What the hell is this? Okay. Well, looks like it doesn't work like that. So that means we have to do some soldering. We are going to implement so called F8 bank switching. I drew several schematics here. The one you're looking at shows how the cottage looks right now. As you see it is as basic as it can get. It's just a bunch of wires attached to the EEPROM and a NOR gate used as an inverter. And this is how the cottage should look like with the implemented bank switching to support 8 kilobyte gains. I know, it may look messy and quite scary, but everything is pretty simple here. I never wrote an Atari 2600 game yet, especially one that does bank switching. But as I understand, the game achieves the switching between two 4 kilobyte banks in the EEPROM by trying to access a special address. As you see, the bits from A12 to A3 are set to 1. A1 and A2 must be 0. And the lowest address bit value could be anything. So our cottage needs to know when the game is trying to access this address. And when that happens, it needs to store the value of A0 until the game tries to access the special address again. The stored bit as a signal should be transferred to the EEPROM's A12 pin, thus making additional 4 kilobytes accessible to us. Basically, if A0 is 0, then we're using the first 4 kilobyte block. And if it's 1, then we're using the second block. So what we're going to use for the cartridge upgrade? Of course, the cartridge itself and two additional chips. One is a NAND gate with 13 inputs and dual D flip-flop. Well, the name kind of sounds funny, but I will explain what it does later. And of course, two sockets for the chips. Also, we're going to use one of these ceramic capacitors. They are 1000 picofarads. We are going to need some, some wire and clippers. And as usual, soldering iron, 
rosin, some solder and the soldering braid, but I hope we won't need that. Let's get started. The first step is a short one. We have to connect additional wires to E1 and E2 that are coming to the cottage from the console. And connect those wires to our NOR gate chip. In a similar manner, uh, the A12 was connected in the last video. This way we get both address bits inverted and if A1 and A2 are both zeros, the inverted values will be ones. So now let's connect the socket for the NAND chip. In the schematic I drew the chip vertically, but I think it would be much nicer to connect it horizontally on the PCB. If we could look at this chip from a perspective of a person who writes code, a programmer, it might look as an if statement with a bunch of ands. With it, we are checking if the A12 and A11 and A10 and up to A3 are 1. As for A1 and A2, since they are inverted, we are rather checking if they are 0. So, if all the inputs supplied to this chip are 1, then the result would be 1, right? Wrong. It's an AND, so it is a inverted AND. So the successful result would be 0, and if at least one of the inputs don't match the address pattern we are looking for, the result would be 1. So in shorter, if the address pattern is matching, the result is 0, and if it's not, then it's 1. So we have to connect a bunch of additional wires in order to branch out all the address signals from the console starting from A3 to A12. Then we need to connect them to our NAND gate input pins. Also, we should not forget inverted A1 and A2 as well. By the way, the chip wants 13 inputs, but we only have 12. So, we can attach, well, let's say A1 twice. But it's up to you which one you want to choose. But by any means, do not attach A0 to the inputs. We need to invert the result from the NAND using the last NOR gate from the NOR gate chip. Also, to prevent the noise, let's add a 1000 picofarad ceramic cap between the output of the NAND chip and the ground. Notice that I'm soldering the capacitor first.
A flip-flop is not just a type of shoe, but also a rather simple memory device. The chip I'm using can store 2 bits, but for our task we're going to store only one. A flip-flop stores the data supplied to its D pin, but only when the clock pin's value changes from 0 to 1. I'm not quite confident about this step, since I'm using a different flip-flop chip than is usually recommended for the F8 implementation. And the reason is, well, as usual, I could not find the right chip and I bought what was available. Let's attach the socket for the chip. Power it up and connect the inverted result of NAND to the clock pin. The chip I'm using should do its bidding if the set and reset pins are connected to the ground. At least the datasheet for the chip says so. Then let's connect a wire to the A0 line that comes from the console and connect the other end to the D pin. This is the final step, so we store a zero value to the flip-flop when the right address is accessed. Now all we have to do is to connect flip-flop's result pin to EEPROM's A12. The A12 wasn't used and connected to, to the ground before, so let's connect them. And looks like we're done. Let's add all the chips to their sockets. All chips are in place, let's test the cottage on our console. Ok, let's put it in. And hope it will work. Guess what, the game didn't work. I found that some address lines were disconnected by an accident. Be careful and always double check. Let's try the game again. And as you see, the game seems to be working just fine. Let's try it out. Okay. So 
Well, it looks it's playable, I guess. Take some, some kind of crap. Yeah, let's, let's get out. Oh, crap. Oh, come on. <laughs> Not again. This is bullshit. Okay. I'm done with this game. So, we can conclude that our modification was successful. The only thing that I don't like right now about this cottage is the fact that I can't play 4 kilobyte games anymore unless I connect ground right here back to 812 pin. I guess I could solder a switch for that. Also, I would like to put more than a one game since there is still plenty of free space left in this EEPROM. Perhaps in the next video I could try to make a multi-card for both 8K and 4K games. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit the like button. Leave your suggestions and observations in the comments. See you next time. Bye.